chapter 6, verses 1 through 5. And it says there, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of His robe filled the temple. Above it stood seraphim, each one having had six wings. With two He covered His face, with two He covered His feet, with two He flew. One cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of His glory. And the posts of the door were shaken by the voice of Him who cried out, and the house was filled with smoke. So I said, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Now before you're seated, fist bump three people and just tell them, I am so glad you're here today. Would you do it? The longer we live in a relationship with God, the better we can know Him, and the better we know Him, the more of a difference we make in our world. I hope today that this sermon will guide us into a greater understanding of God. My text today is getting to know God. I think many Christian believing people know God, but oftentimes it's limited in our understanding and we attempt to know God only in our minds. And like we gain knowledge in life, we use our senses and we deduct and we reason and we build that knowledge from a natural base. But I believe that the Scripture shows us that we can know God in a greater way than just mere human knowledge. And I believe that we can have a greater understanding of Him and of His nature. And as we understand Him better, as in any relationship, we grow closer. And I love the challenge of the Scripture given to us by James. James says in James 4 and 8, Draw close to God and He will draw close to you. We often don't put that into its proper place that God actually invites us. The invitation is given to us to know Him better. But for many reasons, we resist that. Today, we are looking briefly at a man, Isaiah, who by getting to know God, actually became a voice of good news to his own generation a world that desperately needed to hear some good news. You ever feel like you're in that kind of a world once in a while, just occasionally nowadays? As he became closer to God, he found his greater purpose in life. We're looking today at the fact that we can know God. What an awesome proposition that is. When you think about it, the God of the universe, we can know Him. Many times, I think we just take those words for granted. But when you stop for a moment and pause and think about that, that is one weighty proposition. We can know God? Almost seems unbelievable. 
But we can. And the Scripture teaches us. And I believe that it also teaches us that we will never live to our fullest potential in life or live life to its fullness without a personal relationship with God. It's one thing to know God or to know about God. It's a whole other thing to be in a personal relationship with God. All of the religious things that we do take on a greater meaning, take on their real meaning when we are in a personal relationship. We prayed a while ago. What is prayer? I mean, if you stop and think about that, I, I think every religion in the world prays to their deity. What is prayer? For the person who is in a personal relationship with God, prayer takes on an entirely different meaning than just trying to appeal to a deity that is off somewhere and we don't even know if that deity is even listening to us. We're given an invitation of prayer in the Scripture. And we're given an example of what a difference it makes to know God and to know Him intimately and to have a personal relationship. And Isaiah gives us a little snapshot of this in his story. Isaiah was a native of Jerusalem and certainly had an interest in his country and his city, but his life took on meaning only after he came to know God in a personal way. That was when he was able to move into his real destiny and the purpose of his life. Somewhere down the line, it has to occur to us that there has to be more to life. Life must have a greater meaning than just I go to work to make money, to buy things, to try to find pleasure, and then I'm run out of money buying things to enjoy and have more pleasure. So I have to go back and work more to buy more things, to still try to find more pleasure, to try to find life has to mean more than this. And it only does when we come to personal relationship with the living God. And Isaiah gives us a picture of this today and its deeper meaning. Well, when we look at getting to know God, there are some basic questions that are only logical for us to ask. First of all, who is God? What is He like? What does He want from me? What does He expect from me? And the Scripture reveals God to us through His many names. When God revealed himself to Moses, he called himself the I am, the ever present, self existent God. I am indicates his unsearchableness rather than his existence. You realize the Bible nowhere ever tries to prove God's existence? The universe, the scripture says, declares the glory of God. Any, like we used to say, and I'll just say it, just a 10-year-old kid with half sense can look at the universe and look at the design of the universe and realize that you cannot have that much design without a designer. This can't be the accident of the cosmos. This can't be something that just happened out of the blue with no meaning and no purpose behind it. I can go onto the internet and I can look into the future, 57 years, 7 months, 10 days, and, and find out exactly what time the sun will rise right here in New Philadelphia. That is design. There is an intelligence behind that. And the universe itself speaks to God's existence. God gives us insight into His very nature by His names. 
One of the first names that we encounter in the scripture is the name for God in the Hebrew, Elohim. This is a, a, a name given that describes God's very nature as the power that He uses on behalf of His people. Of His people, it is the Creator. In the beginning, God said, "Let us make man." Elohim spoke these words into existence. God, the Creator, God, the Sustainer of all things. You realize that everything in this universe is being sustained by the original spoken word that we see in the book of Genesis. That He upholds all things by the power of His spoken word. God said, let there be, and that was the end of it. And it still is in existence because God spoke. He's Elohim. Another great name of Scripture is El Shaddai. This is the name that God used when He revealed His nature to Abraham. He said to Abraham, I am Almighty God. I am the supreme provider of every need that you ever have. I am the self-sufficient God. Another name that is in Scripture that reveals God's nature is the name Yahweh. And the transliteration of that that's so often used in English for us is Jehovah. This is the covenant name of God. This is God who comes into humanity to make a relationship with each and every one of us. God reveals Himself as the eternal, everlasting, ever-loving God. The self-existent one. Again, everything else in the universe is existing because of God, but God exists in and of Himself. He's the self-existent God. And of course, the name Jehovah or Yahweh is in the Scripture in the Old Testament 6,800 times, the name of God. And then it is joined by other names. We call the, the compound uh, covenant names where God enters into the, uh, into the lives of people and He reveals Himself. You remember God revealing Himself in the life of Abraham when Abraham was looking for a sacrifice and had none. Anybody remember that? And God, and he said, his name is Jehovah Jireh or Yahweh Jireh. But more popularly, I'll say Jehovah Jireh. That means, he said, the Lord will provide. That's a name in scripture that reveals to us who God is. Now, you can know that intellectually. You can learn all of the covenant names of God. But let me tell you something. It takes on a whole nother level of life when you learn it experientially. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Anybody ever been in a jam and you needed God's provision? And God came through for you? Oh, you're awfully quiet today. Maybe a little north and south. We'll get it started this way. See, in Jesus Christ, we know God as the provider. In fact, Paul tells us, My God shall supply all your need according to His riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Aren't you glad of that? There is not a need that you and I will ever have in this life that God will not provide for you when you come to Him in faith. That's who He is. He revealed that to us in His name. Anybody here ever been sick? I mean, we prayed for a bunch of people with sicknesses. What's the point of it if God does not act in the lives of people? But He reveals that in His name, Jehovah Rapha. Anybody heard that one before? It means, I am the Lord who heals you. Doctors, I thank God for every doctor. I thank God for every pharmacist. I thank God for every medicine. I need it. You need it. Thank God for it. But they're limited. Anybody know that? Somebody say thank God even for a few nurses. I just said that because I seen Joan back there. Hey, thank God. 
But any doctor who's honest will tell you that they can't really heal anything. All they're doing is just trying to guide uh, the body, get the body to do what it's actually created to do. You realize we weren't created to die. Hello? We were, God created Adam and Eve in the garden to live. They entered into death. They, they embraced death into the human race. In fact, God warned them. The day that you eat of the tree, you shall surely what? Die. That's where death entered in, Satan. But God reveals his self to us, reveals his nature to us through his name. And on and on we could go. You know, hey, we prayed even in the beginning and we prayed in the Lord's Prayer, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Anybody pray that? Did you mean it? Okay, I'm just checking on to make sure that we're on the same sheet of music. Look, here's the reality. You and I, our own personal righteousness is filthy rags. Anybody read that in Scripture? In other words, I cannot ever in myself do enough of the right stuff to earn my way to heaven. Is that not the truth? But Christ died for me. Christ took my sin and gives me his righteousness. So one of the covenant names of God is Jehovah Sidkenu, which is the Lord, my righteousness. The scripture says he became sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Who's happy for it? That means you and I can have right standing with God today based on what Jesus has done. Do you believe it? Now, it's one thing to know that and to hear that intellectually. It's one thing to be like Isaiah and to know about God. It's a whole nother thing when I saw the Lord high and lifted up and his train filled the temple. And then I realized I am a, per I am a man of unclean lips. Amen. You know, God gave you a mouth to praise him and to do good and not to use it for evil. Am I, did I stop preaching and start meddling? Amen. Is that not the truth? You don't bring any glory to God by uh, using your words destructively. You know, you can destroy a person's life with just a few words. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Some of the, some of the most terrible words of the hum, human language is I hate you. Think about that. How destructive that is. Some of the most powerful words of the human language are words like, I love you. Or let me give you one that even Christians struggle with many times. Are you ready? Fasten your seatbelt. Here it comes. I forgive you. Now, you can just say those words and mouth them, or you can say them from the heart and receive the actual release that comes from that. Those are powerful words. All of us have filled God with our lips. Amen? Is that not the truth? But in Isaiah's case, he touches his lips and cleanses them. And that's the only way that we can serve God is through the touch of God and his righteousness. But what I want to tell you today that the, there's another name there that... Uh, I threw up there as one of my personal favorites uh, when we're talking about these compound covenant names of God is Jehovah Roy or Jehovah Roy, depending on your uh, pronunciation. Anybody know what that one means? Who's real smart? Oh, the Lord, my shepherd. How did you know that, Fred? Oh, he read it. Okay. I thought he's awfully smart this early on a Sunday morning. The Lord's my shepherd. I love that name. And let me tell you, one of the reasons I love that name is by an experience that I had over 20 years ago in Germany. Um, just rewind the wheels of history. Can I tell a little story or do you want to go home and eat pizza? I don't know. Okay. We can order in if it goes late. I just have to tell you this. It was uh, over 20 years. In, in fact, Hannah was not even born yet. Can you imagine a world without a Hannah? 
there we were in Germany, and Angie was, you know how the scripture says that Elizabeth or Mary was with child? <laughs> Angie was with child. And it had been a long time since she had been with child, and she was really sick. She, she had a lot a difficult pregnancy, was in the hospital several times, very sick, and and this thing had went on for months, and and uh, she where we were living at at that time, we didn't have any army English speaking hospitals, so she was going to the hospital, the Krankenhaus, right, the German hospital, and either Ansbach or, or Rotenberg, and she would go in and. You know, 90% of the nurses have no idea what she's even saying and she don't know what they're saying. And it wasn't the ideal circumstance. But but there was an opening in Würzburg where Philip had been born almost 11 years earlier and they had an army hospital there. And uh, it was it just, it was the right thing that I could easily uh, extend my period with the army uh, in Europe and move up there. I thought it made sense because she could get the care that she needed and uh, and it would have been uh, a position at a higher echelon. So it really seemed like the right thing to do. But how many of you know the Lord is my shepherd? I didn't know all of the political stuff that was going on behind the scenes. Does anybody realize that in all human organizations, there are political things that go on behind the scenes. <laughs> believe it or not, believe it or not, I know it comes as a major shocker, but even in the army, they, there were people working some politics and some deals going on there. And, and, but I didn't know it. But one night, as I'm struggling through all of this, I had a dream. Is it all right? Maybe I ate too much pizza. I don't know. But I had a dream that night. And I really should have brought a pair of those army. Anybody remember the army birth control glasses? Do you know why they were called birth control glasses? Because they made you look so ugly. Okay. Should I even go on with this story? I had a dream one night that I was... And I was with another non-commissioned officer that was from the Bamberg area. And guess what we were in this dream? We were lambs. We were lambs, only I was a lamb with a pair of those army birth control glasses on. That's why it's got to be a dream from God to be that ridiculous, doesn't it? And I remember we had trotted all the way over to Heidelberg. Now, it was a long way. And we're up on top of this high mountain area, and we're looking down in Heidelberg. And Heidelberg was the area where, in Usurer, the United States Army, Europe, and Seventh Army, is where they made the assignments within the theater. And we're looking down, and we see all of the people that make those assignments and all the political uh, big shots and everything. And they're down there having a picnic, and they're under this great big umbrella, and they're just enjoying themselves. And I'm, we're up there and I'm sweating. I could feel the sweat coming down my snout in between my glasses. And my, that's how real it was. And I'm looking at this other NCO and I'm saying, don't they see us up here? Why, why don't they ask us to come down? Why, why don't they ask us to come and get out of the sun? What? You know, and I'm, I'm struggling. And I see this particular person, and I knew who it was in the dream, and they got up from the picnic area, and they walk over to this large, dirty pond, which I knew represented the Atlantic Ocean. Sorry about that, but it was my dream, so that's the way it was. And this NCO picks up this frog out of the pond, and female NCO, and she just, oh, like it's a newborn baby. And I'm looking at this other person, this other lamb beside me. And I'm, what, what is, what, am I missing? And she carries it back to the people under 
the large umbrella. And they're all drooling over it. Well, it ended up that they ended up, they were getting somebody from uh, the states to actually take that position. But uh, that I found out later. Uh, but as I'm in this dream, this is where it really becomes personal. I'm like right here, and this other lamb is beside me. And I, I knew who it was. I could feel Jesus, the good shepherd, come right up. And I didn't dare look, but I, could, I knew who it was. And he just barely lifts his staff. I mean, and when he goes like that, it boom, shakes the whole mountain. And he just says two words, go home. And immediately we turn and I'm bouncing down. I wake up because my glasses and the dream are bouncing on my snout. And I woke up with these words. They'll always choose the frog. The world system will always choose the frog. For God's people, your promotion, your advancements come from heaven. And you don't play the games of the world system. But and immediately I found out, and, and I just tried to speed this up some, but you know, what I'm trying to tell you simply is this. You can read words like, the Lord is my shepherd, but that's all they are is words. It's not meant to just be words. These are meant to be a part of our relationship with Him. You can read the Lord is my provider, but when you know Him, when you realize that your employer is not your provider, now let me get a little more relevant. The United States government is not your provider. Ouch! I'm not relying on the United States government. I'm, I'm relying on something a little higher, amen? A lot higher. Amen. God is my provider. God uses employers. And thank God, if you're an employee, you should work hard for your employer. That's what you're called to do. But don't look at your employer as the one who's meeting your needs. Not if you're a Christian. God meets your needs. Am I preaching good yet? Hey, anybody getting anything out of this? Or you want me to just quit? When you come off of the bed of affliction and you thank God for all the doctors, but when you know it is Jehovah Rapha, the Lord my healer that brought me through that, then it becomes real and it becomes personal. Amen, anybody? And the Lord my shepherd. And I would just tell you this, I ended up not getting that assignment and ended up in the process, going somewhere else that put me into the position where I got a better assignment and then got promoted at the next place. Look, the bottom line is, He is my shepherd. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. Amen, anybody? See, that that's what I'm talking about. So, it, the names reveal to us who God is. But until you experience God personally, then it's just a mental exercise. And it has to become more than a mental exercise in our lives. We honor and we glorify the name of the Lord today. Isaiah had a special encounter with God. The name Isaiah means Jehovah is our helper. See, he, he was named. Jehovah is our helper. But it wasn't until he had that personal experience with God that, he, that it took on meaning and he went out and brought the help to the people of his generation that was needed. All right. Of course, Isaiah also gave us that great scripture that his name would be called Emmanuel. Anybody remember what that meant? Or is it this, should I hold this off till Christmas time? God, God with us. That's what Emmanuel means. 
God is with us. And God is for us. God is for us. Now, unfortunately, I'll just meddle for just a moment here again before I try to bring this message. You know, I don't ever finish a sermon. I just find a place to break it off somewhere. And then we pick it up next week. Amen? That's just how it is. So I'll find a place to break this off. I actually want to begin a series next week from Nehemiah on rebuilding our lives, rebuilding our lives. And I think it will be helpful, Lord willing. But God is for you. If you are in a relationship with God, a relationship of faith today, I want you to hear that. If God be for us, who can be against us? He's for us. Now, that does not mean He's for everything that I'm for. That doesn't even mean he's for my agenda. Hello? But he's for me. He's for me. And he'll cause me to change my agenda and get it adjusted when need be. Hello? Anybody found that to be true? But he is for us. That's the important walk away today is that God is not just a word. And getting to know Him, it's not just a mental exercise, and it's not just a word. He is a person. He is God the Father. He's a Father to love and a friend to know and experience. Wouldn't friendship be the strangest thing if it was just a paper thing? Of course, we kind of do that nowadays with Facebook, don't we? Yeah, this person's my Facebook friend, and... And then tomorrow, I got unfriended. What happened? Right? They found out who I really was. No, that's that's very shallow. Friendship is somebody with whom you have personal relationship. With someone you experience. And Jesus is our friend. God came into this world. He put on humanity. He became one of us in Christ Jesus. The Word became flesh and he is God with us for us experiencing God is getting to know God don't fall for a religion that's only intellectual don't fall for a Christianity that's only facts facts are very important and right facts and true facts are very very important in our day but all it is is religion until you come to know Him. I can talk about forgiveness of sins all day long, but when I know He has forgiven my sin and brought me into relationship with Him, oh, what a difference that makes. Anybody know what I'm talking about? So He is with you, and then the Holy Spirit it says, He shall be in you. What a glorious thought that is. You know, if you are a Christian today, that there's nowhere that you go that God's not with you and in you. That ought to give us confidence. That ought to give us a spring in our step, especially in this world. Amen? He's in us and He's with us. That is reality above religion. Otherwise, all we have is religion. And we're just one of the other religions of the world. All the other religions of the world command you to die for the deity. Christianity is not that way. The deity has become one of us and has died for us. That's relationship. He did that to bring us into right relationship. And each and every one of us today can know him personally. Not just about Him, but know Him personally. Would you bow with me? Gracious Father, we thank You for this little passage in Isaiah where Isaiah's life took on new meaning. Where You brought him into a whole new level of living by a personal relationship with the living God. Lord, we pray that as Your Holy Spirit moves in this very congregation today, that many sitting here will hear your call to follow Jesus and will respond to that call in true faith. Cleanse our hearts.
cleanse our minds, cleanse our lips today that we might live before you, live from you, live from your power as we follow Jesus. Now, as I pause for a moment, I just ask you to search your own heart and listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit as he calls you into a closer relationship with God. Ask him to show you the ways throughout this week where you can get closer to God and he will lead you and guide you into that because he is the good shepherd. We give you thanks now, Lord, that you've heard our prayer and you've touched our hearts because we've asked in the name of Jesus.